Hello and welcome to the Capital Area Theater Show. I am your host, Jeremy Patterson, and with me today is local playwright, actor, director. Uh, you've stage managed. Yeah, I've done stage managing, uh, produced. Educator, Paul Hood. Yeah. Welcome, thanks, Paul. Man. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. No problem. Thanks yeah. for joining. Yep. Now, I just listed off all of these credentials and the like, <laughs> and uh, I figured you could uh, follow form and uh, give us a little bit of your background. Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Wow. Uh, let's see. Um, let's go back. I don't know when I really... Well, I think writing for me... First, let me, let me rewind a little bit, because I think film was my first love. And um, I went to Harrisburg Arts Magnet School okay. back when I was in, in high school. You know, I was playing football and uh, trying to figure out what the hell I wanted to do with my with myself because I was I was a confused teenager, confused, insecure. I was trying to find my find my way, and you know, it's to sound, to sound really corny, but <laughs> I was looking for my, I was finding myself or trying to figure out what worked for me, and um, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I was dancing like I was really into hip hop dance. Um, and, you know, I was in, you know, a couple of, uh, break dance groups. I was with one called the Unity Club. <laughs> Some group we started in, like, um, high school, and we, we kicked, we really kicked ass at a talent show one night, and I was like, this is what I want to do. I was like, I want to go out on stage and fill the crowd and, you know, feel the energy from the crowd, and it was cool. We came in second place at the talent show, and I was, like, on cloud nine for, like, that was it. I was like, oh, I want, I want to be a dancer, professional dancer. So, um... Okay, well, hold on. Do you, do you remember what you danced to? No, you know what's funny? Me, myself, and a friend of mine, we made... One night, we were at his, at his house, and we got a cassette tape. You remember those? <laughs> when, oh, oh, way back tapes. when, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, we, got a, we got a cassette tape, and we... I, I knew nothing about music, but somehow, we blended... This, I don't even remember what the song was. It was instrumental, and we blended it with. Um, s we made like a like a basically like a beat, like we produced a like a a piece of music. Okay. Which I still can't like, I can't fathom how I like did that, and to this day I'm just like, how did that happen? But we went out there and like, cause the the Unity Club was it was two dancers, and two MCs. You know, typical, you know, back in the 80s where, you know, the rappers had backup dancers and whatnot. Yeah, G had the cardboard box and all. <laughs> <laughs> had the hammer pants and the high top fade. It was it was incredibly horrible. <laughs> but <laughs> we, um, so we went out there and we, we rocked it out and, like, the, the crowd loved the music we made. And you would think that would spark, like, oh, wow, maybe I should do this. Yeah, yeah. But I just was so stuck on dancing and sports. So go ahead a little bit. Went to the Arts Magnet School for dance the first year. Okay. But then, you know, throughout this whole process, I was a big fan of film. And I always wanted to, like, either be in movies or write a movie or direct a movie. And I was, like, so obsessed with, you know, I was Scorsese, Spielberg, Spike. Dude, when I went to see Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, I, I lost it. I, I was like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. Like, that opening montage with... um. Rosie Perez. Rosie Perez dancing. Yeah. I was like, this is how you open a movie, yo. <laughs> yeah. Replace the overture. Yeah. Bring it's in like, this. Forget that. This is how you start a movie. So I was like so excited. I was like, and this is, you know, a black filmmaker making movies about issues that were like, you know, that issues we still deal with. And it was like racism and you know, like political stuff. And it was like, I was like, I want, I'm going to be a filmmaker. So now hold on. So, the, yeah. so so seeing the opening dance montage in that movie didn't make you go, that's how I have to dance. You just separated to being like, oh, I want to be the person who's filming the yeah, dance. Yeah, I want to be the person making movies like this. Like it's weird. Like it, I I kind of connected to it because she was dancing, but then I was like, but I also loved movies so much. I was like, well, I can do both. <laughs> so, but the the whole thing with film it kind of took over and I, I quit football my junior year. And um, a lot of those guys probably still look at me like, oh, Paul quit on us. Because we were pretty good. <laughs> I went to Harrisburg High, by the way, uh, class of 92. 92 stand up. 
But um, so we, I got into dance, and then I went to the Arts Magnet School, of course, and um, I was like, all right, I think next year I want to do television production. That was the closest thing to like any learning how to direct and you know write and kind of combine the two. So uh, yeah, I sat down with uh, I remember Mike Hillegas, senior by the way. Mike Hillegas senior loved him. He was sharp. He was quick. He was tough too. And like I was like, this is what I need. And I think going to Harrisburg Arts Magnet School, which is now a Capital Area School for the Arts, it, it like really saved me. Because I was so, like, all over the place. I was just trying to, like, figure out what I wanted to do. So there is when I started kind of, like, I don't think I was really letting things soak in. But then I started to realize, all right, I got to be involved in television or film in some way. And theater never even popped into the picture. Okay. Until, like, many years later when I... uh Harrisburg Community Theater, which is now Theater Harrisburg, mm -hmm. was doing a production of a uh, soldier's play. It was, you know, a great yeah, yeah. Pulitzer Prize winning piece of work. And um, for, they, for our listeners, if you want to see a picture of yeah. Paul in a soldier's play, there's one actually in the men's room <laughs> at the Herlock Street yes. Krebsky Center. That's right. There's, it's, I think it's you and... Uh, uh, Daniel Fordham's in yeah. it and some other folk. And folks, uh, yeah, I had hair then. <laughs> For those that know me, you know, I, you know, I don't have hair. <laughs> um, but I had hair then, and I was really skinny. And uh, yeah, it was, it was it was a great time. But I remember auditioning for that play. I was petrified, and uh, no acting experience whatsoever. I mean, I had done some little things here on the side. Um, you know, stood in for. My film friends, when they needed somebody to do something. Okay, let, let, but let's walk, let's walk back there. Yeah, yeah. Because you said uh, you said you, you you got to theater a little later. Mm -hmm. um, at the Arts Magnet School, yeah. you went to Mike Hilligas Senior, mm -hmm. and you said, "Okay, I'm trying to get focused." Yeah. You've gone now from dancing yep. and a little bit of beat making. Yeah. Into saying, "All right, this is you know these are the things that are inspiring." Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about your time working in that film thing. Were you writing in that program in life? Um, no, it was more like technical um, technical aspects, like um, gathering data. It was mainly for like news. I think we did a lot of like, um, they called it, what was that term? It was an acronym. Oh, ENG, Electronic News Gathering. So you had to go out with a camera, gather and take some shots, and then bring them back, and then have the... Um, producer and the uh, technical director line everything up and it was basically learning how to produce a new segment okay um which kind of gave me like an idea of how fast paced that industry works like television really works fast and you know you know how you watch the news and things are timed up and even when you watch like cnn or even like sports center everything's kind of like really kind of quick and sharp. Yeah. So, I learned a lot from that. I learned that basically, you have to move quick. You have to think on your feet. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped me later on when I finally, it took me years to find my voice as a writer because I was experimenting in several different areas. Yeah. So, um, from there, I went to, um, and I wasn't very focused. And that's another thing that I'm I'm amazed at how far I've come because even at that stage where I was like this is I know I want to do something here I still couldn't figure out exactly what it was just the arts it was just the arts yeah, yeah like the whole like community and I was like it's like I know I want to be involved in something artistic I just this is cool but maybe that over here is where I should be or you know I was still kind of confused so this confusion lasted <laughs> For about for about another decade, so um, I got accepted to Edinburgh University, which was another like fascinating thing because I was like, you know, I hadn't even thought about college. Yeah, you know, I was being a really silly teenager and thinking, I'm just going to go to Hollywood and just be like, you know, here I am, let me work in yeah. your studio, and it was crazy, like the, my thought process. So. Um, 
in college I was writing little short stories. Now I'm not familiar with Edinburgh University. It's it's Edinburgh University is in northwestern Pennsylvania in the middle of nowhere. Okay. Yeah, about I don't even know what the enrollment is. One claim to fame Edinburgh has is Sharon Stone went there. Okay, there we go. So myself and Sharon Stone went to Edinburgh, and we both dropped out. So, <laughs> 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 so that's that's another that's a you know that's a claim I guess. That's a claim, a, a, but except she's a little more famous. Than and, us. and the Capital Area Theater <laughs> Show has nothing against Edinburgh <laughs> University. No, Edinburgh University is great. It's a great school if you want to be a teacher. Uh, has a great wrestling program. It's, it, has one of the biggest libraries in all of the state schools in Pennsylvania, too. Okay. So that, there's a cool fact. <laughs> but, yeah, so uh, after high school, um, I'll never forget, um, I wanted to take something up there with me, and I bought this editing machine for film editing. Like an Avid? Yeah, like the real deal. It was, it was nice. I was excited. And my mom got really pissed off at me. She was like, you don't need that. Take that back. You know, here, give it to me. She took it and took it back. And I was like... Like back from school to home? Or yeah, back she, to the store? she back to the store. Back, Yo, I was like, are you serious? <laughs> this was my dream. It's like, all right, what if Jimi Hendrix's mother or father would have took their, his guitar <laughs> and like drove off into the sunset with it? Yeah. <laughs> what, would we have had Jimmy? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was one of those moments. I was like, what if that changed the whole trajectory of my like my dream my career or whatever and that was this now or this was then this was then you were like, just you were just like mom i yeah. can be i could be an editor i could be an editor a, a like director yeah or? who knows what i could do with this thing i could learn i could teach myself how to edit film that could get me in to like you know i could work at a studio and then all of a sudden i'm writing a screenplay so that's how i think in little cycles and patterns like that but um, but she, she crushed that when she you were crushed school. it <laughs> so I was like alright well there goes that dream so I kind of like I still was attached to film mm-hmm. which we'll, we'll get into later because as you know I used to review yeah um, I still was attached to it but the technical part of it from that moment and from the struggles I had in school kind of made me go well maybe the technical part of film or television is not my, not where I should be. Okay. So I started to focus more on the the, the artistry of it, like the, uh, the character development, the uh, the storyline, um, the cinematography. It's all things that make film like beautiful and engrossing. So. Now are you now are you studying this in school or is this just as a as a outside? Fan? Yeah, well that was my I was my major like I met. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was I was. Uh, I actually hooked up with a guy, I can't remember his name going way back, but we started a film club called Real to Real. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we were working on a movie, like, from like, when I was there as a freshman to the middle of my freshman year. We were actually developing a movie, so I got to see, like, you know, a cryptic <laughs> style of development of a film. And, you know, I, I was, I, now that I think back on it, all of these little things were like learning. I was learning. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it was like, you think, oh, I'm doing this and I'm screwing it up. And it's never going to go anywhere. But it's really, you're learning. You just don't realize it until later when you get focused. Yeah. And you start to have like a really intense like drive. You're like, all that stuff that I went through and all those weird projects that never happened. And I'll, I've been involved in a lot of projects that started and stopped. You know what I mean? So now when something goes the whole way through, it's it's beautiful. You know what I mean? I'm like, wow. Yeah. So so you're at this point, you're you're studying film, mm-hmm. and you're in a film club, and you say you've decided that maybe the production side's not for you. Yeah. And you're still open to analyzing all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Were you writing the film in the development process? Um, no, I was just basically um, doing... Uh, one time I did sound on a film project for someone. Okay, so you were just like crewing around. Yeah, I was just crewing around, learning, you know, still doing like, you know, the tech stuff. Because I, I had learned... I had a kind of a head start on a lot of kids at uh, Edinburgh because of the Harrisburg Arts and Magnet School. So, um, 
I knew a lot of like how to level sound for you know a shot, how to compose a shot, like just little things like that, and that gave me like kind of a leg up. Yeah. And you see like that learning process. So I was I wrote um, what was it? I can't even remember the title. I scribbled something on a steno pad <clears throat> that I was writing, and um, the one English teacher. <laughs> He was like, he looked at it. He's like, all right, we, we had to write a short story. And mm -hmm. my one English class there. And um, so I did Act 101 because my grades weren't great. So you're familiar with Act 101, right? Okay, so Act 101, it's, they don't, I, I don't know if they do it anymore. Maybe it's a, it's, they call it something different now. Is if your SAT scores are kind of iffy, <laughs> but, you know, you have good grades you know what I mean overall your GPA is okay they'll let you go to summer classes so I went up there and I did that and before the fall semester started and um, I remember we all had to write a short story for my one English class and I forgot the professor's name but he wrote on like I gave him like my first draft or whatever and he wrote on my the one sheet he was like how did you get here? <laughs> like, in the story. And I was like, that was kind of jarring for me. But later on, I knew what, you know, I started, I was like, whoa, this, he actually was really trying to find out where I was going. Even though it might not have been, you know, great writing at the time. It's like, well, how did you get here? And so, another learning lesson, you know, when you start off at A, B has to happen, and then C has to happen. But you can't fall off and lose your theme within, you know, your the overall story. You have to, it has to connect in some way. Yeah. So when I started writing screenplays, I took that little moment and I started to kind of know how to connect the dots. And then I wrote a couple of little screenplays here and there. Now, you started writing because he asked you that? Yeah, like, well, I got... I, instead of being discouraged, I was like, well, let me answer his question. Okay. You know, for, you know, even if, you know, he never understands what I'm trying to do. I got to answer this question, you know, for maybe for myself. Like, when I'm writing, how am I going to get this character from this point to uh, the next point? <laughs> so, that taught me a lot, man, and... So I was reading books on, you know, film, working with different film students, learning a lot. And then, you know, it started something that happened in, while I was in college that really discouraged me. And I think it was, and this is going to sound really crazy. And this is when you find out. So the summer semester ended. And then fall started and I was like what is this this is totally different from what I experienced in the summer and like here are all these people that aren't like me okay so you're so you did now is this between high school and starting school or is this just between freshmen and yeah this is uh, after high school after I graduated I went to Edinburgh and that was your act 101 time act 101 time then the, the real semester real semester started okay and it was like culture shock okay and I was like you know, and then I started working with the, the film club and whatnot. And, um, but outside of that, I was really uncomfortable. So, so that, that culture shock you're talking about, really, that was a setback? Yeah. And, you know, I was like, We're, who are all these people that aren't like me or you know, aren't like people from, you know, Harrisburg or whatever? And it just was weird and I felt really out of place. And then I just started to lose focus again. I left the film club. And then uh, eventually I left. I left school because I wasn't ready. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think my decision to go to a um, to go to college instead of like an arts magnet, like school, like an arts school. Yeah. And you know, like the maybe the Pittsburgh Art Institute, maybe like a liberal arts college. Yeah, or something. like a liberal arts would have been would have been a better better idea for me. So um, I left, and I was still writing. Um, here and there, I was writing um, poems, little short stories. Mm 
mm-hmm. and then um, you know just, I never still wasn't getting into plays that you know I never thought about writing a play. Okay, but now your short stories and your yeah. poetry. As a film fan, are you stepping into writing film at this point? Yes. Um, okay. I would take uh, like small scenes from one of my short stories and like turn them into like a short, you know, like a short scene. Like a proto screenplay. Yeah, or something. yeah. Okay. And, um, was still learning how to write, like, do like the form because when you write in screenwriting, it's very there's a like a certain um, form to it. Yeah, the format. For the it. format and, you know, like the way it's laid out. Um, I was doing that. But the funny thing, I was doing it by hand. Oh, okay. Which I think made me uh, not a lazy writer, per se, because I felt like the act of writing itself physically with a pencil is kind of exhausting. I don't know if... Well, you're an artist, so you know. Yeah. When you sit down and you draw... And that physical act of your hand moving and you really focusing on the paper, it's, you know, um, it's kind of one of those things. It's like like reading. Your eyes, you, your eyes are going back and forth. It's a physical thing. It's just, you might not feel like you're exerting yourself. Yeah. So I think that is what, that's why I'm pro, so prolific now because... I was writing everything by hand for years. And you had that discipline yeah. for cranking out the work. Yeah, yeah. And like I still like to write with a pencil. Um, like before I write a new play, I sit down and write with a pencil or a pen and like outline it like that. Go long form. Yeah, long form. I, I love long form writing. I still like it. Um, keyboards, you know, I like the tactile like feeling of banging on the keys, but writing with... A pen or a pencil on a sheet of paper. Still, I still love doing that. So I was doing that for a while, and I kept all of my writing just like all over the place. <laughs> I was so sloppy. Mm-hmm. Um, I had stuff all over the place, and then um, I'm all over the place with this. It's hard to talk about your life. And I, like, I understand, man. Yeah. It's all right. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I enjoy it. It's just one of those things where you're like, I don't want to miss anything. I want to get it all right. Because it's, it's a lot. But I, so I left college and I came home. And I hooked up with some really good people, man. Like uh, Jason Rex, who's a really good friend of mine, who's a filmmaker. And I want him to, Jason, make more movies. <laughs> Get back into it. Well, he's still doing things. I think he's doing like more uh, television work. But and then Zach Forsman, who's a good friend of mine, who's out in L.A. Okay. We they were making a movie called Cold Hearted, and I got a chance to work with those guys who are way more talented than myself as far as like filmmaking. And this is back here in Harrisburg. Yeah, this is when I came back, and um, I was still going to clubs and dancing. Oh, okay, so you, uh, yeah. so you started dancing again. Yeah, I started dancing again. I'm, I'm clubbing like crazy, going to New York, Baltimore with all these great, like amazing dancers. Eric um, Durden, who's out in L.A. right now, who's like teaching at USC. He's teaching hip-hop dance at USC. And, you know, he's traveled the world. He's danced with like some great talent. Like um, he was, he worked with Mariah Carey, you know, just to name like one person. Uh, he's... He's done it all, so I'm I'm running around with guys like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, so I'm dancing, and I'm still doing the film thing. I'm hanging out with you know Jason and uh, and Zach, and then my one friend, rest his soul, um, Raymond Pendleton. We called him Bimo. It was him, um, myself, Jason, and uh, Zach, and we are working on this movie called Cold Hearted and we had like the best summer ever. You know what I mean? Just like making a movie. Yeah. Um, so that was a great experience because I got back into that love of film again okay. after having that discouraging episode at college. And I was like, yeah, I still want to do this. I still want to be a part of this. Yeah. So I um, started, you know, trying to develop my own screenplays on the side and then... Um, I detoured, somewhere along the way, I detoured and got into writing poems. Okay. And 
I think that was when I was like, how? It's one of those things where you do it and you're like, something happens and it makes you go, I shouldn't be doing this. Okay. And here's the weird, like I wrote one of my, this girl, I was like, I think we I think we were dating. I, don't know. I had an interest in this in this woman like years ago and I wrote her a poem. Shortly after I gave her the poem, she she broke up with me. And I was like, that's a sign. Okay. So stop Yeah. Stop doing poetry. Stop now. doing poetry. So I you know, I was <laughs> I was going to like readings. Do you remember the wire coffee house? No. Okay, you, you're way too young, dude. <laughs> you were, I always forget how young you are. Well, it's funny. You're just, you're just like, ooh, shout out 92. And I'm like, yeah, shout yes, out. I was four. You were four. <laughs> so I was, um, that was a good time, though. I, I, I had a great time. That's when Harrisburg was like nothing like it is now. There was nowhere to go. There was like two places to hang out. We had like one or two coffee shops. And the wire was one of them, which is actually was in New Cumberland. Okay. So I was going there for open mic, reading poetry in there, and I, you know, I thought it was great. And I was like, you know, it's one of those things. I'm learning. I'm still learning the power of words. Okay. You know, I'm still learning, like, you know. And I think there was this little thing on my shoulder, this little guy on my shoulder, saying, "Hey, you need to." Write, just write, you just do it in some way, find your voice. It's going to take a while, but you'll get there. So poetry, I thought, you know, no, I was like, all right, I want to be a poet. I want to be the guy, you know, standing up in a coffee house, getting the finger snaps. Yeah. A smoky room, you know what I mean, wearing the cool black jacket, <laughs> <laughs> jazz music playing. I was like, that's what I want to be, you know, that's the guy. I need to leave and go to New York City or, um, so... So that girl changed all that? That girl changed all of that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> changed all of it. All right, so I took those poems, though, and I was like, let me turn them into short stories. Okay. So the poems became short stories, and then the short stories became uh, novels, and then the novels became screenplays, and then the screenplays became plays. So you were so you're just walking through all of walking these through forms. all these different forms, dude, and like it was, and I'm so glad that we're circuitous. Like, I'm glad it happened like that, because I feel like if you grasp poetry, or even like graze it and look at the possibilities of how these words connect and paint a picture, paint it like give that person an image. Yeah. And makes sense. There's the art. That's the art in it. Like, when you listen to a poet, and you can... Because when I go to poetry readings, I still go on occasion to poetry readings. You look at the audience. Some people are sitting there with their eyes closed. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. Well, that's, how my, that's how my dad does at concerts where we go to see people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, they're really seeing what that person is saying. So if you can paint a picture with words, that's what poetry is. Mm -hmm. It's painting with words. I mean, that's my perspective on it. So I was like, if I can do that, if I can continue to like know that that is what I need to do, um, you know, I'll maybe this is where. So as I was writing novels, and I had one published under, um, I wrote a really horrible novel that shouldn't have been published. I was really shocked. But then I found out the publisher was complete crap. And so I was like, there, there's that thing again. So, you're, you're, so you're, you're walking through these different forms. Yeah. And as you get these things that, you could, that you're taking as signs, mm -hmm. you're, you're just running with them as like, okay, well, that's a sign not here. That's yeah. a sign not here. Yeah. So uh, quick, quick question. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of times in passing in kind of in a humorous way, mm -hmm. uh, a lack of focus. Yeah. Which is fine. Mm -hmm. I share that. Yeah. To say you have a lack of focus, but it seems like you're consistently churning out work. Yeah. Is the focus and the discipline you have associated with the volume? Like, do you feel like 
I'm disciplined enough to know that I can produce a lot of work? Mm -hmm. Or was it a, I'm trying poetry, I'm going to be really disciplined at poetry, Mm -hmm. and even if other things are scattered, and then it's like, okay, that sign, that girl says no to this me, you know, poetry, Mm -hmm. step to the side, I'm moving into novels. Mm -hmm. Is it, you you can be disciplined in those, or is it just you're disciplined in that you write? I'm disciplined in that I write. Like, I... You know how people say, oh, I need to be inspired? Yeah. I think to myself, because I don't want to offend anybody. Mm-hmm. That's bullshit. <laughs> what? That's like, writing for me is like, you know how you get up and you're like, all right. First thing you do when you, when you wake up, what do you do? You go take a leak, right? That is so perfunctory for me. Like, I need to do it. Like, okay. it's something, it's that kind of thing. It's like, it's like breathing. Like, if I, if I don't write, I get moody and strange and weird. And people that know me know this is true. I get, like, I'm like, I feel like I haven't eaten. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like sustenance. So, I, um, it's just part of, like, life for me. Like, part of one of those things. And, and it's just one of those things that you're able to share with, with people. Yeah. So, it's like that for me. Like, I don't know what I would do without it. So, so regardless of what else is go- what else, whatever else is going on, yeah, you're ju- at this point you're you you're in it to be like to write daily and yeah, I'm well, writing so I won't like be an asshole. Okay, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I think I think without it, um, I feel really uh, how can I gonna say it? All right, you know how you feel when you dress up, like say you put on a great suit. Yeah. And then, like, you take off that suit, and you're, like, in your underwear, or you're, like, you're just sitting around in a t-shirt. You're comfortable, but you're like, man, I felt awesome wearing that suit. I want to put that suit back on. Yeah. Let me wear that suit tomorrow. So you get up, and you put that suit on every day, and it feels great. And you're like, oh, man, I don't want to take this off. That's what writing feels like for me. So... Uh, is that how you were feeling in in the time of this this novel that was published? Is yeah, I felt like every night or morning or so I write in the morning better actually. Uh, every morning when I got up, um, I put the suit on. Okay. And I didn't want to take it off, and it'd be hours, hours would go by. I'd be like, oh my god, I need to eat. I need to go be social, or I need to. And you know, I was really in it, man. I wrote this novel. It's called On the Double, which I actually um, had adapted later on into a screenplay. And um, I was up, threw on the Steely Dan CD. I love Steely Dan, by the way. <laughs> threw on the Steely Dan CD and would write my brains out until like, you know, I get up at like 9 and write till like 1 in the afternoon, which might seem like a small session for a lot of people. But for me... That's you know that, that's your thing. Yeah, it comes in. It comes in weird, and as I've grown as a writer, I, it, it's even shorter now. Which that's why I have to keep you know finding other things to keep me occupied, like you know, watching sports or going to the gym. Uh, all things writers don't do. <laughs> Work out. Who works out? No. Uh, hey, yeah. I, as 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 a non-writer, yeah. but a fan of as a fan of the arts, I, there's probably no one right way. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I gotta I gotta wear the suit every day, man. So so you step from having this novel published, mm-hmm. and you say later that becomes a screenplay. Yep. What what age are you here with the novels published? Ooh, how was I? Uh, I was approaching thirty. Uh, I was living on Second Street in Harrisburg, um, in Midtown. So I was uh, about twenty. I was about twenty eight. Okay. Now is now are you acting at this point? No. Okay. Um, Just at, well, well. Here's the the acting thing, and see, this is where connecting the dots verbally is much harder than it. it um, I had, I was in Soldier Story in ninety three when I came back from Edinburgh. Okay. So now it's done. <laughs> so that was already like. The, the novel came out years later, um, about, it was, it was shortly after or before 
So I remember because that was, you know, everyone remembers where they were when that when that happened. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was about that time. But I was in a soldier story, and um, soldier story was in '93, and then fast forward. After Soldier Story, I didn't do anything else other on the stage for years because although it was a great experience, mm -hmm. I was petrified of that that anxiety that you feel as an actor before you go out on the stage. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know if I want to feel that again. Okay, but that but that didn't lead you to writing plays. No, it led me. It still led me. It kept me. I was writing little short stories because I published my first short story in '96. Okay. And a motorcycle uh, enthusiast magazine called Long Riders. And um, the story was writer in rear view. It was about some really weird, corny tale about this guy who's driving late at night and he sees this Harley. Well, he sees his motorcycle behind him. And um, he realized <laughs> it's so bad. This is embarrassing. But when he discovers who's on the bike, this is a headless rider. He gets really freaked out. But the only thing he can really think of is how cool this guy's Harley was. Okay. So <laughs> it had to have a motorcycle spin on it. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the theme in that story was how we get caught up on things that are shocking, but you can be concerned about something that's not as important as the actual shock. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this guy doesn't have a head. He's riding a bike, but that's a great Harley. Yeah. So they found that humorous and funny, so they published it. So that's so that's ninety six. That's ninety six. That's when I published my first short story ever. Okay. You know, I was writing weird tales up until then, but that was my first uh, published work. And um, from ninety six to about um, ninety nine, two thousand, I I wasn't writing anything. Like, I had a weird four or five year spin where you would think, oh, I'm published now. That would fuel me to write. Yes. I had this weird, like, gap where I didn't write anything. So you had been fueled by the rejection <laughs> and the acceptance. You were just like, all right. Yeah, that, I'm good. That, yeah, it was. Okay. Yeah, so it's like, that's why I'm like, wow, it's just so strange to see where I am now. Okay. Because that usually sparks someone to go, let me keep doing this. This feels great. But I was like, oh, this is cool. And then I'll just, you know, I'll put on my baggy clothes, mm -hmm. my backpack, and go dance at the club, and that was it. Now, you know? 96, you have that published, mm -hmm. and then you take a break. Mm -hmm. A long break. <laughs> now, you said right before 9-11, so that's 2001, mm -hmm. is your novel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How quickly did your novel come together? Or was it composed of previous, of bits of previous things? or No, it, well, it took me about... I would say six months because... Okay, so so when you say you took your, your break for a few years, mm -hmm. it's like 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, yeah. and then 2001, I write, burst through in like a six-month thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, and then in between there, um, I had um, my first child, my daughter, who's now 16. Wow. <laughs> um, so that, you know, being a father, you think, all right, this is what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a father. I don't need to write... Writing, that's an art. You know, I got that weird, like, mentality that... You are compartmentalized. Yeah, I was like, all right, I got to separate these things. Um, so, had a very tumultuous relationship with the daughter's mother. Um, so, there again, I was dealing with that. And so, that kind of sidetracked me. But, um, you know, I remember writing, working on this novel... Well, my daughter would go to sleep because I would keep her every other weekend. She would stay with me. And me banging away and like, you know, I'd be up all night. And then you the next day I got to be dad. And it's like, oh So my you God. moved on from handwriting at that point. You're, <laughs> yeah, you're I was like, like I'm going yeah, to be on a computer now. <laughs> just, I got to type this out now. This is working. Um, and plus I was scared of like losing, which is weird because Woody Allen, who's a, I'm a big fan of, Still doesn't use... As a writer, right? Yeah, yeah. as a writer, as a writer. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> I love Woody's work. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, he still doesn't use, like, a typewriter or a computer. And so I'm like... But I'm, I'm weird. I think if I use paper, 
I'm going to lose that more than I would lose the electronic version of whatever I'm writing, which is ridiculous. You'll never lose paper. Well, not well, not now. Now yeah. it's not because I mean, you type something, it's in the cloud, yeah. it's in the, it's in the the the, uh, the the Google Google Drive. Yeah, it's like so many places to put your work now. But um, so at this time, you're 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 typing away. Yeah, I'm typing away and I'm working. So I'm writing novels, and um, I uh, about a year after that, I started working at. Um, over at at the IBM building where Pen Live is now. Okay. I was working for a company called Washington Group or something. They made computer parts, and we had to get those parts shipped to different companies um, like Walmart, like for big giant computers. Yeah. So I'm I'm doing that. I have an office job. I'm working in a cubicle. I'm like, is this what is is this what I'm supposed to be doing? But anyway, so I'm uh I'm doing that. And then one day, I'm surfing the net, and there was this, this website called Harrisburg Online. Mm-hmm. And they were like, we're looking for people to write um, for various parts of this website. I was like, well, I really like movies. Yeah. Let me give this a shot. Let me see if they need somebody to review movies, because I love going to movies. I see about four movies a month. I might as well talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And I like writing. So I combined those two, and... Um, I sent the webmaster uh, at the time. I forgot. Why am I forgetting his name? But uh, I met Jersey Mike through this website. Okay. Um, who was, as we all know, um, did a big justice to our local music scene in Harrisburg. He kind of like, you know, like, um, what's it? The, uh, what's the company that sets up uh, through, I'm forgetting the name of it, but. He did a lot for like the music scene. He was like a, a promoter. So he was doing music reviews, and I came in as a film reviewer. Okay. And I, you know, after my first review, which was pretty horrible because I kind of spoiled the movie, I started learning how to tighten things. And see here, I'm still learning. Like I, I started learning how to tighten, tighten what I'm trying to say and get to the heart of it without giving too much away. Okay. So I did film reviews for a while, wow, like almost 10 years. I got involved with the Harrisburg um, Arts Fest Film Festival with Caleb um, and Tara and uh, Andrew and all those guys are great over there um, with Mantis Collective and all that. <clears throat> so I got hooked up with them and um, I, you know, I was involved in film heavy doing reviews and then I started to gain some type of following and then from there is where I was like oh man I really want to try that theater thing again you know I really want to get acting acting wise acting as well as writing but I think it was more on the writing end I was like I wouldn't mind trying to see if like some of the stuff I'm thinking about or talking about in these stories I have hidden all over the place or even these poems that I've written years ago I wouldn't mind seeing if I can make these things work on a stage, you know. So, um, yeah, I just started putting, like, taking my screenplays and just adapting them into plays. And I remember I did one, my first reading in Harrisburg. Do you remember what year this is? It was two, th- let me think. It was... I remember. It was 2010, I think. Okay. Because this one, it was the the Poetry Cartel was at Midtown Cinema. Okay. Where I was seeing a lot of my movies. So, um, I did a reading of a play called um, Long Gone Cold Night. It's about two teenage girls who um, are driving in this car and they keep passing on the, they keep Right, driving on the same road. Okay. And they're like, why Why can't we get off this road? And basically it was purgatory. Okay. Because they weren't accepting their fate. So uh, Dodie Kane, this character, comes along and finally starts to tell them, all right, this is what's going on. This is how you get off this road. Did you know how everyone gets into these weird, these weird cycles and... 
And you think they're going insane, but then someone comes along and says, you are, but this is how you get out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's 2010. Yeah. And so I do a reading of that, and that's, that's when I was like, oh, this is immediate. This, I didn't have to go through red tape. I didn't have to get rejected, like, personally. You know what I mean? Even though I, I can accept. See, I'm, I'm still at 42. I'm still better with artistic rejection and I you know I deal I hate personal rejection and so you feel you do you do you feel it's more personal to be rejected with a novel like I understand poetry being like this is me yeah putting it's myself raw, on like, yeah you. but uh, so you feel that theatrical rejection um, there's so many different aspects to it it could be because I've had rejection letters where they say oh your play is great we just don't know how to market it okay or your play is great but we can't cast, and I had this happen a few years ago, we can't find any black actors. Yeah, yeah. Which is a huge thing. And then, or we, um, it's most, most times it's marketing or um, it doesn't fit. Or well, we don't have an audience. We don't have or... the audience for it. So, but, so, you, you, so those rejections, uh, and, and this is a personal inquiry, mm -hmm. have you ever had the rejection that says we don't like this play? I haven't. Do you have wood here? <laughs> I haven't had that yet. Okay. I mean, I'm pretty sure, you know, my Rejection's work, rejection. Yeah, but yeah. My work's not for every. I've had people get up and walk out during intermission, but it's only like one or two. I haven't had a full, like... <laughs> the audience exits. Like, clears. Yeah. I had, um, a, I had something really kind of heartbreaking one year happen. And it was, oh, it was during the Sequin Royale, actually. You, all right. I know what so, you're talking about. Yeah, I had a, I won't say names, but I had a publicist that I had actually leave my show at intermission. And I was like, wow, this person's supposed to be, like, in my corner. So that was, like, that hurt, you know. But, so, you, so you're at this point now, you're going from 2010 on, mm -hmm. you say, or it seems, and once again, if I'm incorrect, correct yeah. me, it seems like you're saying... Theater, there's a lot of variables that I'm in the room for. Yeah. And if somebody's, re and nobody's rejected me saying I don't like the work. Yeah. As opposed to where some of these other things, it does feel like a rejection of me. Mm -hmm. So you're like, this is, this is your, this is your wheelhouse now? Exactly. So you've gone poetry. Yep. Novels. Novels. Reviews. Reviews. Well, and screenplays, then reviews. Screenplays, reviews. Yep. And now you're getting into theater. Now I'm getting into theater. And... I think all of those weird things that happened to me as I was coming along, that was my that was my college. Like people are like, Oh, where did you go to school? Or, you know, who did you train with? And I'm like, honestly School of Hard Knocks. Hard knocks. Like I'll come from the school of like, you know, that's why I admired play playwrights like Ed Albee and um Shepherd and you know, you know, these guys have had Life punched him in the face. You know, Albie came from money, mm -hmm. right? But he still, like, really went to New York as a young man and dealt with all the, you know, all the, the crap. So, he, so he, he went and had a life. He went and had a life, you know. And he was a, a gay man in New York in, you know, the 60s. And he's still trying to find himself. And then he gets beat up. And he's trying to live off his the money he's getting from his family and he's living in New York and then one day he's like he has this horrible moment and he goes home and he sits in his apartment and he writes zoo story so so you're 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 from the you're hoping I'm just going yeah. to say cuz I I don't know if it's a thing where you can define it at, mm -hmm. at this point yeah. you know hopefully your career continues yeah. for a very long time uh that's that's the the lineage that you you care to be a part of. Yeah, and you, you you're not a, you're not a uh, an academic writer. No, no, I'm writing. My plays deal with life. Well, no, I'm yeah, saying yeah, I'm I'm academia, yeah, academia, yeah, academia, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I um, no, you know, I I like doing the workshops and the speaking engagements and all that, um, because I get to, and I think that's why people connect with me at, in those various um, times is because. You know, I'm not coming at them like, oh, you know, I'm the playwright with the tweed jacket and the 
patches in the pipe. I'm not that guy. <laughs> I'm a guy you can have a beer with. Yeah. And be like, all right, let's talk about plays with me. I could talk about them intelligently, but not insult. I don't want to insult people. I just want to say, I want to take life and flip it over and say, look at this. Look at this from this perspective of this character. Mm-hmm. That's kind of cool, right? It's different. So that's what I'm trying to do, and that's why when I, uh, I sat down and wrote Long Gone, I converted, I adapted Long Gone Cold Night into a play. Um, I'm sitting on my, wow, I've moved so many times in the city of Harrisburg. <laughs> I've lived all over, over the city. Um, I felt like, that's why when I read Ed Albee's biography, or even, um, even, uh, Warhol, mm-hmm. when he left Pittsburgh and went to New York, he was moving all over New York, but he was absorbing like all these different things and then started creating all this great art. So I think all of that stuff that was happening was setting me up to really be able to like put my heart out and expose it to like for everybody to see. So all of these weird accumulation of like memories and things I wanted to forget lost loves and weird things that happen, rejection, um, living, you know, being almost homeless for like three years, um, you know, just doing dumb stuff like all over the city. Set me up to write Aldous Remembers. And that was like, that was my zoo story. So I wrote Aldous Remembers and what is Aldous Remembers about? It's about a guy. Now, well, hold on. Before, okay. we, before we get into yeah. it. Long drive, long gone, long cold gone, night. cold night. Yeah, is is your first, mm-hmm. the first, I'm theatrical yeah. piece. Yeah, and then from there you do. That's where you step to. Aldous remembers is next. Yeah, I um I started writing. Um, well, I was working on that and then doing film reviews still. Okay. So I was focusing on film reviews, but um, you know, sitting in my apartment one day and I, I pulled up. And it's, it's so weird when you write that one thing, you're like, oh my God. So I'm writing, I'm writing, um, Aldous Remembers, and I started to think, well, what is this story about? Going back to that question. Going back to that, yeah. So I'm like, where am I going? Where Where am I taking people? Where am I taking myself? Yeah. So... I was like, you know how I started to think back to the first time I was, I thought I was in love with someone, okay. and like how great that felt, and like all the cool things myself and this person had done together. And I was like, what if there was a guy that, because of those memories, they were so great. Something in his mind, because of the, the fondness he had for this life he had with this other person, what if he wanted to forget them? Because of the, the, pain of, the pain of the loss was so great. He's like, I just don't want to remember. Yeah. So I'm like, what if there was a guy that did that and then started to think he, didn't, he wasn't in love with his wife anymore? So I... Um, I sat down and I started writing this play about this guy that doesn't want to remember anything because it's too painful. And then Aldous Remembers came like out of me. And I remember how exhausted and emotionally spent I was when I finished the play. And it was the first time I ever had that, that, that raw feeling of like emotion when I was writing. And I actually started to cry during the last monologue, which, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this because I still want to thank you, Mr. Patterson, for using it, the monologue as an audition piece. I really, that's like a big honor, but, um, that's where that came from. That, that last monologue from Aldous when he just tells, you know, he tells his wife how he feels and, all of those things that I didn't want to remember, and I brought them back. 
And they like they really it was like a flushing of like all this crap that I've been through. And I think that's what made that play work. Okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> I got the play published, which I'm kind of like, wow, I, sh- I don't know if I should have done that because now I, I don't think anyone's really going to see it or like have it produced because it's, and that's the, that's the double-edged sword uh, per se like, with publishing a play is that you can, you, you kind of lose it a little bit. Because okay. you can't really go, all right, let me go get this and do a reading of it, um, which I did at Midtown Scholar, which was great, which further made me go, I need to be writing plays. Yeah. It's because, um, you know, I had uh, Aaron Bomar came up to me after the show and was like, wow. He was like, what? Basically, in, in a matter of words, he's like, where the hell have you been? Yeah. And I was like, I've been here. I just, maybe it, t- it took me this long to get. To get to the medium. To get to this medium and. Realize, I should be writing plays. So that was the jump start of like me going, all right, I'm going to focus on writing for the theater. Because I, I just I remember the experience I had working with um, Tom Chris Stetter. Did I say his name right? Um, with Theater Harrisburg when he directed and Lois Hagee, uh, who I'll be working with um, next spring. And I'm very happy about that at Oyster Mill. Though that, I remember that that awesome feeling of being in a theater and having that communal, that community of people all working toward one goal, um, and I was like, why did I even get away from that? Yeah. You know, I did it with film, of course, but film. Well, film's a director's medium. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's just like, once the and, and the writer always gets you know the writer and when you're writing a screenplay they take your screenplay dude they chop it up. You're sitting at home with your little uh, your little check, if you're lucky enough to get paid, and they're hacking up your screenplay, and you're like, you know, you get your little advance, drive off in your Honda. <laughs> no offense to Honda drivers. <laughs> I drive a Civic. It's, I'm not a screenwriter. Hey, I drive a Ford. I don't, <laughs> but yeah, you drive off in your car, and you're like, wow. And then it sits... It sits for like 10 years and you option it. Yeah, you get paid. I didn't want to go through that. Yeah. I want to write something and be like, oh my God, I got to share this. And here's what I like about theater. You can get a group of people, which I've been doing pretty much the last six, seven years. Mm -hmm. I've been getting people to just say, hey, let's read this play and share it with people. Mm -hmm. Luckily, my work has been accepted and I've done so much since. And, you know, it's just, it's been a nice ride, you know? All right. So, yeah. I don't know all your work, but I'm going to step through the few pieces mm-hmm. that I, I, I can I can remember. Yeah. So, you go, Aldous Remembers mm-hmm. is where, where I met you. Yeah. Um, did the Sequin Royale. Yes. You've done Other Cat. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brighton's Green Street. Yes. My Electric Life. Yes. Uh, what am I, am I, am I missing any? What am I missing? Oh, uh, the ones that I've had read or workshopped in the area? Yeah. I think you just named all of them. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. so okay, I've, I've at least been able to witness or yeah. be a part of a lot of these. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, you know, it's, it's not a, nothing yeah. to hide that I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> how do you come to the, I mean, and obviously we don't have the time to dive into all of these, but yeah. I'm sure for any of our listeners, uh, we're going to provide a link to Paul's Facebook. Yes. And then if you feel open, I'm sure he'd be open to sharing the work with yes. people. I, um, I have no problem um, sharing my work with people. And that's the thing. I don't want to be at that point where I'm inaccessible to people that enjoy reading my work. Yeah. I'm like, it's, it's art. I mean, you know, the only way it becomes inaccessible to anyone, I've in my opinion, is if it goes anywhere near Broadway <laughs> or, or when it gets published. Or you, you, yeah. out, you outprice yourself. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So um, I'm very humble because um, this journey to finding my voice in writing in general has been really great and awful and scary. And, you know, it's been all of those things. But, 
you know, we just did My Electric Life um, a few weeks ago down in Lancaster at the Steinman Theater. It was uh, directed by Brian Phillips, produced by Cynthia Charles. It was um, sitting in the audience and actually going, oh, I can sit and relax and watch my work. That was the first time <laughs> since I started writing plays. That's the first time I, I was hands off. So, this, so so it's been about six years. Yeah. And and at year six, yeah. you got to that place where you can just enjoy. Yeah, just go wow, you know, this is happening, and I don't have to, I don't have to direct, I don't have to produce or anything. But I'm stepping back into the director's chair per se uh, next spring at Oyster Mill Playhouse. We're not gonna we're not gonna reveal what it is. We're not gonna reveal the play, but I'm directing. Okay. And it's an awesome play, and I hope. Uh, people come out and see it. Yeah. Okay, so we worked through your background, mm -hmm. got up to where you are, and you just touched base on the most recent production of My Electric Life mm -hmm. and being able to accomplish and achieve some things mm -hmm. that uh, that hopefully allow you to cement and feel, feel as a legitimate playwright. Mm -hmm. That you could go sit in the theater, have a director, have a producer, have a cast, yeah. and, you know, have a, th a theatrical home for this show. Yeah. You mentioned directing moving forward. Yeah. As a writer, yeah. what would you like to tackle going forward? Because usually what I ask people is, what's a dream role that you want to play or a dream show? And, you know, you've touched base on... Uh, who you probably, you said you feel are your uh, thematic contemporaries and yeah. the like. Uh, you don't have to reveal any, st any specific stories if you don't like, yeah. but uh, what, kind of, what kind of writing are you tackling now? Like, do you feel, now that you've had that experience, that that was like, you know, a, that, did that pro is that propelling you? Mm -hmm. Like you said some of the rejection has, or is this a thing where... Like with the acceptance of the novel, yeah. where you're kind of like, you're you're taking it and it's it's evened you out. Because mm -hmm. I and I've always known you and like you said, the suit of getting up every day and writing yeah. is a big deal for you. Mm -hmm. Are you getting up and you just writing because you have to, or are you like I am now chasing this type of story? Yeah. Um. Actually, my I'm working on a play right now. It's a full length play. Um, it's very personal and you know how you start to work on something that's so personal it scares you mm -hmm. but when you sit down you're like oh wow you know I, this is the counseling session that I should have had for this whatever it was getting at me earlier in life yeah I'm writing that play right now and like um, there's a purpose to it um it's for me to get past a lot of the stuff. Um, so now I'm writing. I have more purpose now. Like I'm better with doing, staying within my theme. It's not just, oh, I got to write because of guilt. <laughs> like if I don't write, I feel guilty. Like I still struggle with that. Um, if I go one day without writing, I get really weird. And I got to get connected to something, either read a play or... You know, go see a movie or just stay connected to the art in some way. Um, now I'm writing with, like, this is what I want to say. This, I think, is important to share. So, you know, I still get on, put the suit on, mm -hmm. you know, to use that metaphor again. Um, but now it's like, I put it on and I go, all right, what kind of tie? <laughs> What kind of tie do I put on today? Do I do a bow tie? Do I do a uh, Windsor knot? You know, the long tie? You know, just those kind of things. So now it's like purpose. I, I feel like it's more purposeful now. Okay. Like, um, I'm, I've stepped into doing absurdism. Okay. Um, I wrote an absurdist play called Displaced Cosmonauts, which I still want to get read in the area. Um, basically, it's about the personification of weed and alcohol. And that whole, like, you know, the two women that are, like, attached to them and, like, really addicted. And, they, you know, one person decides 
there's something that happens within her life that makes her go, all right, I'm done with this situation. So um, um, I just finished writing that about um, back in, like, I think last summer. I submitted it to um, the International Theater Arts Institute in New York City, and it was uh, it made it as a finalist. All right. So that excited me, and I was like, all right, well, I got that far. Let me bring it back to Harrisburg. So I'm still trying to find somewhere to have this play read. And then I wrote another short, absurdist uh, work called The Itch of Gloria Fitch, where this woman has this, uh, this itch, this internal itch within her. And you, you find out later why, what's, why is she itching. There's more to it than just like her itching. There's like something within her that she needs to get out. Yeah. She needs to excavate it. So I just finished that. But in between that, I'm writing this other uh, play. And um, the working title of it right now is called Kill Keller. Uh, sounds morbid, but it's really a story about manipulation, religion, and like family fallout. So it's heavy stuff. Yeah. But that's, I think, this play. I'm hoping has the effect on the, the my readers or audience that is having with me right now. It's like I want people to go, oh wow, I know someone like this. And that, that's the thing. Like with all of my characters, I want my audience to go, I know that person. Okay. You know, I, I or that's me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. my electric life. A lot of people are like, wow, I'm. I really need to rethink how I connect with people. Yeah. You know what I mean? I need to put my phone down during dinner or like just put it away in general and just take life in, you know? And we're all guilty of that. I still get on my phone when I'm sitting in the waiting room or if I'm on a train going to New York. I get on my phone and I'm, I'm sitting there going, I'm such a hypocrite. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's like this life though. That's what it's like. But So, yeah, I'm, I feel like I have... I want to be the storyteller from the urban perspective for everything that's going on in Harrisburg. I have way more stuff to talk about. I got, I want to talk about the gun violence. I want to write a play about the gun violence. I want to write a play, well, Brighton Screen Street touches on the gentrification mm -hmm. from two different perspectives. Um, but I want to talk about the gun violence. I want to talk about you know, maybe the political corruption issue that, you know, that's happened, that's, you know, things that have happened in the uh, in the area. And then there's so many stories, but I, I feel like I need to, like, share those stories with people. Okay. And from an urban perspective. I, I mean, I'm a city, I love cities. I love city life, so I'm channeling a lot of the, the energy and the negativity that I take in, you know, through my daily life and kind of putting it into dramatic form, so. Okay. Yeah. Now, we're, as we as we start to start to wrap up, mm -hmm. uh, you talked about Albany and you talked about Warhol. Yeah. And you talked about how they bounced around their cities. Yeah. And then wrote about their cities. Mm -hmm. Or not Warhol per se. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you yourself have bounced around Harrisburg a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do you feel that you're an equivalent? Like, what New York was to Albany mm -hmm. and those experiences and the bouncing around, do you feel that's Harrisburg for you? Because you, you, like when, you, when you know, I asked you what you wanted to write, you yeah. said about the city. Yeah. Uh, like, Wilson... August Wilson mm -hmm. wrote about Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh pri yeah. primarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that the connection you feel as a writer, heart-wise, to this city? Yes, um, definitely. Uh, I feel like, like I was in Brooklyn a few months ago for a reading of Other Cat, and when the actors were reading the play, and uh, they made references to like flooding and um, Midtown. I was like, wow, you know, I'm really, I'm doing it. Like, I'm writing about my, where I grew up, you know, the city that I live in. Like, and I feel like, um, finally, it's starting to like, I'm like, whoa. You know, Paul Hood, playwright from Harrisburg, you know, it's, it has a nice 
ring to it, I think. You know, because it's like, well, then, you know, when you think of a playwright, you're thinking, oh, New York City. Like, everyone yeah. gets that image. You're like, oh, this guy's living in New York. Like, no, there's playwrights, great playwrights, not living in New York City. There's, they're all over the place. Yeah. So I'm like, I want to be that one from Harrisburg where, you know, people say, well, you know, Paul Hood used to sit at Midtown Scholar and write write most of his plays, which I have, <laughs> wrote most of my plays at Midtown Scholar. Like, when I'm dead and gone, I want people to be like, wow, he sat up there and wrote that, you know, you know, that's the connection I want. Like, I want to have that stamp on the city. Because I think, not to sound egotistical, I think I've earned it. I think I've earned that. Because I... Now, when you, you, when you say you've earned mm-hmm. that, yeah. what, what, what is the that? The, 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 the title of, of playwright or like our, our, our playwright? No, the title, like when I say earn, I mean like earn as far as like, while well, he really sweated it out and told stories about our city. Okay. Our city, you know, like Harrisburg. Um, and that's what I mean. It's, it's kind of one of those fine lines where you're like, oh, you know, this guy, you know, his ego. I don't, you know, and anyone that knows me knows I'm the most humble person. But I just want to be remembered as the, the guy that told stories, Harrisburg stories, you okay. know. And, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with this city, but I think all, that's what... All artists do with yeah, their views. Yeah. And that's what I think is interesting Interesting with a lot of my plays. Like, I had somebody read Displaced Cosmonauts, a New Yorker read Displaced Cosmonauts. And she was like, oh, I love this play, blah, 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 but it's not a love letter to Harrisburg. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's because my characters are dealing with an issue and, you know, they're being real about it. Yeah. You know? No, everybody hates, like, West Shore people hate East Shore, you know what I mean? People that live on the hill won't go downtown. You know what I mean? People that live in Midtown won't go up on the hill. It's like... Yeah, there's, there's all those weird divides. all those weird divides. Like, City 10 miles by 10 miles wide. Yeah, I can walk. <laughs> I can walk from uptown to, to the hill. Yeah. To Allison Hill, for those who aren't from Harrisburg. But I can, I can walk. I'm like, yeah. you can walk this whole city. Where, where's the problem? I can walk to the West Shore if I wanted to. Or yeah. ride my bike. You know? It's not, it's not a big deal, but... With that, there is stories in those little pockets. Different stories. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with Brighton Spring Street, bringing those two worlds together, bringing, you know, Alex Park's world and Brighton Howard's world together is that one story. And, you know, that's kind of, I just want to be remembered or known as the guy that's like talking about, in dramatic form, issues about Harrisburg. And, you know, I've, I've been to hell and back in the city. Yeah. So, you know, I've, that's what I, when I say I feel like I've earned it, I feel like I've earned the right to write stories about Harrisburg. You know what I mean? And be confident about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, awesome. Yeah. Well, I think that's a wonderful place to, to, to end this. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for sitting down. Yeah, thank you, man. Uh so, ladies and gentlemen, usually I I end with a plug for uh, for a show or something, but I'll say uh, keep an eye out for the upcoming works of of Paul Hood. Uh, you know, uh, the listeners hopefully are just you know the 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 area of Harrisburg and around, mm-hmm. but uh, speaking for myself and hopefully for a large portion of the audience as a uh, Harrisburg, Harrisburgians, or however we we are <laughs> burgers, identified. I think we're <laughs> oh, okay, oh, sweet, that's cool. All right, as a burger, nice. Uh, as a burger, uh, we look forward to you telling our stories. Yes, thank you. I look forward to telling them, man. This is this has been great. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, man, this is this is awesome. I'm glad I got a chance to, you know, go on about my life and my work <laughs> yeah we'll have to have, we'll yeah. have to have you back when you're when you're in production for something yeah awesome all right thanks paul all right thank you